The cold, dark walls, the damp, musty air were a far cry from the wide open spaces and fresh breezes of the wilderness that John the Baptist called home. His home now was a small, dark jail cell. And after being there for six months, it was beginning to wear on him. Why was he still here? After all, hadn't he been the chosen one, the one who was called to come and proclaim the coming of our Lord? After all, wasn't he that voice in the wilderness, the voice that called people to repentance? And after all, wasn't he the one who had proclaimed humbly that he must decrease? in order that Jesus might increase and be glorified. This certainly wasn't what he had in mind when he had spoken those words. And now the questions were rolling around in his mind, is this the way God really treats his chosen ones? Is this the way it's going to end for someone who has been so faithful to God? And as those questions roll around in his mind, we realize that John the Baptist, having been called by God, one who knew the Scriptures, should have already realized the answer to those questions. Our Scripture reading reminds us today that the prophets of old had been persecuted. And in your Bibles today, if you turn with me over to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, We want to look at some other famous people that John the Baptist certainly would have known of. Hebrews chapter 11, and we're on page 1192 in your pew Bible if you're following along. Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to pick it up in verse 32 and read down through verse 37. Hebrews 11 being that chapter in the Bible that we know as the hall of faith, that description of God's faithful people, we see some of them listed here at the tail end in quick progression. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, and they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. God's chosen ones of old had seen some glorious things, hadn't they? Delivered from the mouths of lions, delivered from the fires. But they had also experienced something that was very real in God's people, and that was the persecution. And John the Baptist certainly would have known about those things as he sat there in his darkened jail cell. And yet those questions kept ringing in his mind. Where is God in all of this? Is this where it's all going to end for me? And those questions finally become so much that John can't hold them in anymore. He sends his disciples to go to Jesus. And in your Bibles, turn to Matthew now, chapter 11. And we want to look at verses 2 and 3. Matthew chapter 11 and verses 2 and 3. Page 965 in your pew Bible there. Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. And when John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect what? Another one or someone else. Those are pretty amazing words, aren't they? From the man who was the forerunner of Jesus himself, who came proclaiming 
the coming of this new kingdom, came proclaiming that the Messiah was at hand, all of a sudden asking the question, are you the one? Or should we be expecting someone else? And the question that is asked, though we don't read it, if you really are the one, if you really are the Messiah, what am I doing in here? And we quickly see that John the Baptist, like many others, perhaps had expectations of Jesus and His kingdom that really weren't of Jesus and His kingdom. John the Baptist, like Jesus' disciples and like many of us today, often have different expectations of who Jesus is and what His kingdom is all about. And for John the Baptist and even for us today, there is a realization that we must come to about the kingdom of Jesus. I want you to keep your finger here in Matthew 11. We're going to come right back to it, but go with me over to the Gospel of John. Just a few books towards the back of your Bible there. John 15, and we want to look at verses 21 and 22. John chapter 15, and actually verses 20 and 21. John 15, 20 and 21, page 1069. Jesus speaking here, and speaking of His kingdom, this kingdom that John the Baptist was part of ushering in, remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will do what? They will persecute you also. They obeyed my teachings. They will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Jesus makes it very clear to us today that his kingdom this kingdom that John proclaimed will face what? Persecution. Because Jesus faced persecution. Because our world today, for the most part, does not know God and they don't know the name of who? Of Jesus Christ. Did you know that if you ever face persecution, it will not be because of something you did? It will be because those persecuting you do not know the name of Jesus. And taking Jesus into this world is taking Jesus into a world that doesn't always welcome Jesus. Doesn't welcome the truth about the God that we serve. And John the Baptist was now experiencing this. The very kingdom that he had ushered in, the very kingdom that he was proclaiming, he now was beginning to understand, was filled with persecution. And that brings us to our eighth and final beatitude. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. And we notice something if we've been following along here. The first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There is a bookend on either end of the beatitudes. And it involves the kingdom of heaven. And as we've been going through these, we've been reminded that really the beatitudes are nothing more than God transforming our characters that we might be like who? Like Jesus. And that's what the kingdom of heaven is that God could come down to this earth and transform His people, that they might be like Jesus. It wasn't that Jesus ran out of promises to give at the end of the Beatitudes and said, okay, well, let's just go back to number one again. He does it with a purpose. 
because this is all about the kingdom of heaven. But we go back to those beginning words, blessed, which we know means happy. Happy and blessed are those who are what? Persecuted. This one is a little different than the seven that we've addressed up to this point. It's easy for me to find happiness, joy, that blessed state of being in the first seven. Because it's a good thing for my heart to realize that the heart that God wants is one that is poor in spirit. Because this heart recognizes I bring nothing to the table when it comes to my salvation. It is 100% through Jesus Christ, through the blood of Jesus Christ as we heard today. That brings joy to my heart because when I look in the mirror, I know this ain't getting there. And even though we may read of mourning in the second beatitude, we find joy and, and a blessing in that because we recognize that we are so in love with our friend Jesus that we never ever want to do anything that would go against who He is. And our hearts experience sadness when we come to that place. But there is a blessing because we know the comfort of Jesus in His forgiveness and His grace. There's a blessing in the attitude, in the the character of meekness. And in seeking after, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And knowing that He will fill us. In sharing the mercy of God that we might obtain mercy ourselves. In being made to be pure in heart. Isn't there a blessing and a joy in that? I long for the day when this heart is totally like Jesus'. And to be a peacemaker. Wouldn't that be a joy in our world today? To be like Jesus and to be a peacemaker. There they are, those seven, they are good. They make us feel good. We can nod our heads, we can say amen, but we come to number eight, and happy are those who are persecuted. Happy are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. That doesn't come so easy off the tongue, does it? And it didn't come easy for John the Baptist. If anyone ever should have been able to face persecution, it would have been John the Baptist who came proclaiming Jesus, who baptized Jesus, who said, look, behold the Lamb of God. He understood who Jesus was. He understood there would be persecution that would come upon this one he was calling the Messiah. And yet his expectations of the kingdom of God were flawed, much like ours are. And now he's in jail and he's asking, Jesus, who are you? Are you the Messiah or should I be expecting somebody else that can really do something about this awful place where I'm at? And so he sends off his disciples and we turn back to Matthew chapter 11 now and we read verses 4 through 6 because in Jesus' answer, we have our answer today when it comes to looking at this issue of being in peace, understanding the blessedness and the happiness that comes in being persecuted. For righteousness sake. Matthew 11, and we're going to begin here in verse 4 and read down through verse 6. Now imagine before we start reading, if you were Jesus and John just comes asking you these questions, are you really the Messiah or should we be expecting someone else? Imagine how you might have answered. As I read through this this week, I know I wouldn't have answered the way Jesus did. I would have probably had something to say to John that would have been along the lines of, you better know I'm the Messiah. But Jesus doesn't go there. Look at what Jesus says. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. 
the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. In Jesus' words, we see the answer for John's question. Perhaps not in the way John was anticipating or the way we would have answered it, but we see the answer because Jesus simply says, this is what my kingdom is all about. Three kingdom truths we pull out of these verses today. Number one, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are healed, and the deaf hear again. You look at all of those people that are mentioned there, the things that they're facing, the blind, the lepers, the deaf, the lame. Who were they in Jesus' time, in John's time? Who were they in the culture? Who were they even in the church? Had any of them been attending our church today, they wouldn't have been in here with us. Not because there wasn't any room, but because they were not welcome. Their place would have been the parking lot. Or perhaps that would have been too close and they would have been across the street at McDonald's. Because you see, these people were the trash along the side of the road whose existence only was there because they were begging for something to keep them alive. These were the rejects. These were the ones who were such bad sinners that there was no way out of the life that they were in. These were the unwanted, even in the church of that day. And Jesus tells John's disciples, go back and tell them, tell him, that in my kingdom, the rejects, the unwanted, have value in my kingdom. They are loved in my kingdom. And they have a place in my kingdom. Go back and tell John that's what my kingdom looks like. And a kingdom that values those who have no value is a kingdom that is worth dying for. Secondly, Jesus says the dead are raised to what? The dead are raised to life. Go back and tell John that I understand that he is in jail. I understand he doesn't want to be there. I even understand that in another six months, his head will no longer be attached to his shoulders. I understand that he is going to die for my sake and for the sake of righteousness. But my kingdom is not about death. For in my kingdom, the dead are made alive. And John, this message is for you right now that you may know that I am He who was to come. Because in my kingdom, it's not about death. I will overcome death. My kingdom is about life. My kingdom is about eternal life. And my kingdom is worth dying for. And thirdly, Jesus says, go back and tell John that the gospel is preached to the poor. To those who have no value, there is good news in my kingdom. You know, the kingdom that John and Jesus came into was one where the ones up here were the only ones that mattered. The ones up here were the only ones that had a voice. And the ones up here thought it was all about them. And the way into the kingdom was being just like them. Jesus came with a different message. Being up here didn't get you anywhere. But being poor in spirit got you everywhere. And the ones who heard the Gospels, the ones that understood the Gospel message, were the poor in spirit the ones who would be changed by the gospel that Jesus Christ would preach in His kingdom were those who were willing to understand that it wasn't about them, but it was all about Jesus. 
And in Jesus' kingdom, it is all about what Jesus will do for you and will do for the Johns in this world that are facing persecution. But there's an interesting thing when it says there that the gospel was preached to the poor. That phrase, to the poor, is actually one that can be rendered in a different way in the Greek. And it simply could be said this way. And many commentaries actually uh, look at it from this perspective that the gospel was preached by the poor. Because you see, in Jesus' kingdom, he's not the only one who preached the gospel, is he? Look at the followers of Jesus. Who were they? Were they the well-known Pharisees and the preachers and the teachers? No, they were just folks like you and I. And they were out there doing what? Sharing the gospel. John the Baptist, he was no one of any fame, just a guy out in the wilderness who wore leather clothes and ate grasshoppers. And somewhere along the line also baptized a few people and brought an understanding of the need to turn our hearts to Jesus and His kingdom. In Jesus' kingdom, it's not about who you are when it comes to the gospel. It's about who Jesus is. And in His kingdom, we all can share the gospel. And that's a gospel that is worth, that is a kingdom that is worth dying for. And verse 6, Jesus says, go back and tell John, blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Who doesn't fall away on account of my kingdom. Because my kingdom is not like that of the world. My kingdom values the unvalued. My kingdom isn't a kingdom of death, but it's one of life. And my kingdom is a kingdom of the gospel. Proclaimed to the poor, proclaimed by the poor. Go back and tell John not to worry. This is the kingdom of heaven. This is a kingdom that is worth dying for. Xianji is a 30-some year old Chinese woman who up until a short time ago was sharing the gospel message in her native country in China. Sharing a gospel message of Jesus Christ in a country that does not welcome Jesus Christ. One night as she lay in her bed trying to go to sleep and put aside the fears of what she experienced every day in her life sharing the gospel, which she did mainly by printing and putting out an underground newspaper that told about the good news of Jesus Christ. But every night when she would lay her head on the pillow, even though she knew the Bible verses that said, do not fear that God is with you, there was a fear in her heart and there was good reason. And on this night as she laid there trying to go to sleep, it all came down very quickly. The door was broken down. Some local men along with some soldiers came in and beat her severely and drug her out the door and shoved her in the back of the car. Oh, she had been arrested before, but it was never ever like this. No going to the police station for questioning. This was a trip to an old abandoned warehouse where she was shoved in a corner room with a concrete floor and some rats running around. She was beaten with a wire whip burned with the ends of cigarettes, and raped, and then was given a sheet of paper to sign that essentially asked her to renounce her faith in Jesus Christ, but not only that, but to incriminate one of the other Christian pastors in the area. She refused to sign the paper. The beatings and, unfortunately, the rape went on that night and she refused to sign her captors finally getting bored with the torture they were putting her through decided to try something different 
And so they put her in heavy leg shackles down on her ankles, one of which was now broken because of being beaten so often. And they forced her to walk around that room without stopping, without resting, without sitting down, carrying those heavy chains. Exhausted from the beatings, broken and bruised, she drug those chains around and around that room. And after hours of doing that, something began to roll around in her mind. Is this really the way God would treat the ones He has chosen to share the good news? Why would God allow this to happen to me after all that I have done for Him? Is He really the God? that I thought he was? Or should I be expecting someone else? She began to wonder if it would be that big of a deal to sign off on the sheet of paper. After all, if this God were really the God she knew, and this was really such a bad thing just to sign a sheet of paper, God would forgive her, right? And so in her mind, she began to contemplate signing that sheet of paper. But it was at that very point that for the first time she looked down at the ground on which she had been walking for hours and hours. And for the first time, she noticed that for every step she had taken, there was a trail of blood. Her footprints in blood on the concrete, back and forth, circling around the room. The blood was gushing down her legs over her ankle. And at that point, she realized something. She realized that she was doing something Jesus had done some 2,000 years before. In her mind, she envisioned Jesus walking from Jerusalem to Calvary, a cross on his back, beaten to within an inch of his life. Surely, every step he had taken would have been a step that left a trail of blood. And at that moment, she was overwhelmed with a strength that she had never, ever felt before because she realized she was following in the footsteps of Jesus. And she realized that this is what the kingdom of heaven is really like. Because I am walking with Jesus. And if that's what the kingdom of heaven is really all about, then that is a kingdom that is worth dying for. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven.